Hi guys, welcome to lesson two, week one. If you could pause the video here and write out these do now questions and attempt them, I will go over the answer in a second. Okay, here are some of the answers. We'll do this live, remember, on Zoom, but please check it with your own answers. If you have missed anything, add some more information, that'd be good. Okay, lesson two of week one. We're looking at theories and laws again, a continuation of that. And in particular, we're going to look at the scientific method. So, last lesson I introduced scientific laws and scientific theories. I gave a brief explanation about what each of those are. And there is a bit of overlap. So you can see here, this is what we call a Venn diagram. And on the left hand side, we have scientific laws. And on the right hand side, scientific theories. Um, so let me just read this out. What is distinct about a scientific law is it describes a set of actions. Most scientific laws are simple and the base, like base of scientific discovery. So they are something that sometimes doesn't change very often. What they both have in common with scientific theories, they're used to predict events, used to make technology more advanced, and both are assumed to be true by everyone. What is specific to a scientific theory, however, is it explains a wide range of observations and experimental results. So a law doesn't explain anything, it just describes how it happens. A scientific theory uh, constantly changes as more information is gathered. So in terms of the theories we're going to look at, the theory itself might not change, but the volume of evidence that is presented helps make that theory more dis uh, distilled over time, so clearer. Some scientists confuse the word scientific theory with the word hypotheses. A hypothesis is something that we test. Remember I talked about a testable hypothesis? And we test that hypothesis using experimentation. A theory is the conclusions made based on the evidence from said experiments. Okay? The scientific method is important and you may see different ways of explaining the scientific method depending who you speak with. This is quite a simple diagram, okay? And we've started with some of this in term one. We were looking at observations and inferences. So let's start at the top, okay? We make an observation, whatever that may be. Let's use our bird formation uh, example that I used at the end of last term. So we propose a question and we perform background research. So my observation was that we sometimes see migratory birds flying in a V formation. So I may ask myself, why did they do that? What is the benefit of flying in that formation? I then might perform some background research to see if there's any evidence or studies that have told me what is going there, what's happening. And often the time we find is that there might not be any sufficient answer. There might be some evidence there, but not a lot. At this stage, if you decide you want to conduct your own experiment, you would construct your testable hypotheses and you'd select or develop models that you're going to test, and you design experiments to test this hypothesis. So that's quite a big job to do at the start. It can take a long time, depending on what type of experiment you want to do. Then you run a controlled experiment. So remember, we were talking about controlling variables. One of the really simple examples we've been using a lot is plant growth. So say I wanted to check how well a fertilizer was working on plant growth, I'd need to control certain variables to understand or to make sure that I'm just measuring the effect of the fertilizer. So some of the things we talked about uh, to control was the size of the plant pot, the type of soil, the, amount, the volume of water, the amount of sunlight, blah, blah, blah. So all that stuff has to be controlled. So you can't just go off and do something random. It has to be a really controlled experiment there so we can know that your results um, tell us something about what you were trying to test in the first place. So the next stage is you check your experimental results for uh, reproducibility. So remember we talked about replication. That's super important because we need to know if this is a one-off thing or this is actually a result that we can see over and over again through the same experimentation. We then analyze the data and compare them with our predictions. So. A lot of people, a lot of scientists, um, it's called negative results. So say I had a hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that something was going to happen, like fertilizer A was going to increase the growth of plants. 
And I found that actually the fertilizer stunted the growth. That's a negative result because I it's completely against my prediction. And a lot of people would then think, oh, my experiment wasn't right. I must have done something wrong. Um, but that's not the case. Okay, Just because the data doesn't always support what you've initially believed doesn't mean you've done a bad job at all. You may have to revise your exper experimental design. That's okay. You may want to try it again and again just to make sure. Um, but your predictions may be wrong, and that's why you did the experiment in the first place. So don't ever lose faith if that happens to you. Then you're going to determine whether the data supports or disproves your hypotheses, and you're going to determine how conclusions fit in with other information. What does your data look like compared to other people's data who've conducted similar experiments? From that, you may want to repeat the process, or if you found something out really interesting, that may then make you think, okay, I want to continue and do another experiment. So you, it's a continual process. Science is never finished. There's never anything that is set in stone. All things can change, but we can strengthen hypotheses or theories, I should say, by collecting more and more evidence. Okay, so the development of a theory is really important. And the theory is based in concepts and principles. Therefore, concepts and principles help to understand and explain what is going on in the world around us, and in many cases predict future events. In science, theories are constantly revised as new knowledge is discovered through research, and new technologies provide new data and evidence to prove or disprove a theory. So technology is something we're going to look at in detail for a, a full term, and we have already talked about technology quite a lot. Remember last year, particularly looking at the Big Bang, the WMAP satellite, which allowed us to look at the cosmic background radiation, the radio transmitter that Penzias and Wilson used that discovered the cosmic background radiation, the Hubble telescope, which has got its deep field view, that allowed us to see multiple or hundreds of galaxies in one photograph. So technology is always going to get better, I hope, and allow us, give us new insights to things that we, we haven't seen before. So again, I've already given a little bit of an example, but say we have a theory as an explanation of why something happens, and that is based on a number of observa observations that we maybe have made ourselves or somebody else has made. So concepts are symbolic representations of objects or how something works. For example, movement, a tree, a car, or a computer. Principles explain the relationships between these concepts, the movement of a car. So the principle is when you apply multiple concepts to one example. The formation of a theory is important, and again, it's circular, like the scientific method I just described. Okay, You have your speculative stage. You ask questions about a subject, and you try and do some background research. Then you do your descriptive stage. You collect your own data and gather your own evidence. Then you have your construction stage. What does your development, sorry, what does your evidence say about this theory? What does it suggest? And then you have your validation stage. You repeat your experiment or you have others look at your work and ensure that what you've done is correct and above board. And then you go back to the speculative stage. What does all of that mean? Okay, so hopefully by now you're getting an idea that science is never finished. Okay, you always can add more and more data to strengthen the evidence that you have already to base or for formulate your theory. Number one, the speculative stage attempts to explain the event or the phenomena. The process starts with a question about the event. For example, observe the image and think how many times you sit under the stars and wonder about the vastness of the universe. Is the universe finite? Has it got an end point? Or does it go on forever? So, as a species, we're extremely intelligent, but we're also extremely curious about the world around us. And I think that curiosity has been really important in our evolutionary history to make us one of the most powerful species to ever live on this planet. And that curiosity, I think, is something that we have from a young age. And basically, as a scientist, is you never lose that curiosity. You never stop asking questions. If any of you have ever been in contact with a toddler before, you know that they ask a lot of questions and 
really uh, a scientist is somebody who just hasn't stopped asking questions and I think it's I'm biased obviously but I think it's a good way to live your life never stop asking so imagine you saw an article or a video online about an earthquake again you might think about what forces are driving this natural event what's happening underneath the continents that cause these tremors so remember in the last lesson I talked about Wegener and the theory of continental drift earthquakes are not new Okay, they've been around forever and we as a species have no doubt encountered them for thousands of years. It's now only recently that we've developed an understanding about why they happen. So it's might, it might seem obvious to us why it happens now but for thousands of years we've been like why is the earth shaking and you'll see a lot of religious texts um, would equate, no pun intended, um, things that are happening here with tremors and volcanoes and earthquakes related to some god um, some religious explanation because we didn't know why it happened okay so the descriptive stage is stage two during the descriptive stage data is collected to gather evidence evidence to support the hypothesis data can be qualitative so this data that is used by collecting letters so words and we talked about this a bit last term or data can be quantitative quantitative numerically measurable data so remember the difference between those two words is the l and the n qualitative data is data collected using letters quantitative data is data collected using numbers and myself as a a scientist a biological scientist um, mainly collecting quantitative so all of my training was in quantitative data analysis qualitative data something that i'm trying to get my head around now um, but this is mainly the social sciences where you are studying humans, you're maybe doing interviews, questionnaires, that sort of thing. The amount of data collected must be a representative sample. So what does that mean? I'll explain in more in a little second <coughs> with a nice little image. But a representative sample is a sample that may need to include hundreds or thousands of data points. To be a representative, a sample may need to include hundreds or thousands of data points. I put that twice not as an error, but just to make sure you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so we may have to have hundreds or thousands of data points. Well, look at the study we're doing at the school where we're investigating the impact of physical education, occupational therapy and resilience training on cortisol levels. If I just did that with two students, for example, it might work really, really well, but it could be just because those two students responded well to the experiment. That's why we need to increase our sample size and make sure that we have enough people in the experiment that the results that we get from that are compatible. We can say with some certainty that, you know what, our sample was pretty big and we believe that it represents the majority of the population. So this is quite a good um, little graphic here. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you look at the population, it's impossible to include the entire population of a town or a state or a country or the world into an experiment. That's not going to happen. But what you need to do is your sample, your sample has to be representative of that population. So for example, um, I'm almost 30, I'm a male and I'm from Scotland. So if we did a study that was looking at the effect of cortisol on teaching ability for example but the only teachers we used were 30 year old males from Scotland then the sample isn't really representative of all the teachers in the world okay you'd want to have more diversity in your sample to ensure that you're you have a true representation of the population okay that's really important stage number three is the constructive stage at this point, the gathered data is analysed and compared to previous theories. And this is an important part of the development of the final theory. Statistical analysis of the data will show the significance of the differences between the observations and the results. So this is really what sets people apart from being interested in scientists to becoming a scientist, I think. What you have to do with that data, it's all well and good if you go and do an experiment. But if you can't analyze that data properly, and we need to do statistics, maths, to analyze that data, 
then you're not going to be able to tell me much other than what you can kind of see by just looking at the data with your own eyes. We need to do some statistical analysis. And when you do the statistical analysis, it gives us more robust information about what's really happening here. So once this anal analysis is completed, the theory statements are formulated to answer the hypotheses and explain the concept and principles around the phenomena. So after you've done your analysis, you can say, okay, this actually worked quite well, it didn't work well, and the stats back this information up, okay? How do we represent the statistics? Well, we do a lot of background statistics where we do a lot of mathematical equations, but mathematical equations don't look fantastic on a bit of paper. I happily admit when I look at a mass equation, unless your name is Demo, I don't think it is exciting for most people. Um, or easy to interpret, I think that's the key part. It's not easy for us to just look at numbers on a page and understand what's happening quite quickly. That's why we use graphs, okay? This is graphs are short for graphical representation. And graphical representation of that data allows people who may not know the mathematics underneath or underpinning all your statistical analysis to still understand what it is that's going on. And there's a whole bunch of ways that we can represent our data. And one of the things that I think isn't explained is there's no right way of doing it. You can display the data in any way you see fit. There are definitely ways to do it that are probably easier to understand and produce than others, but you can have multiple versions of gra graphical representation to showcase and highlight your data to people, So, which makes the most sense. So one of the things we're going to do this term, you guys are going to be doing your own investigations and collecting data and producing graphs. So it's important to understand that there's no right or wrong answer. For a lot of this stuff, it's down to preference, but I'll be talking you through some of the tips that I have for picking the most appropriate way to represent your data. Okay, and finally, your validation stage. Once the theory is constructed, other scientists may start performing their own experiments making new calculations and collecting additional data from different situations. During this process, the theory is being validated and sometimes new evidence might disprove the original theory and replace it with a new one. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what are we talking about here? Well, currently in this moment in time, there is a bunch of scientists going around the world trying to produce a vaccine for COVID-19. And we have, I think there's about 80 labs, I so on the news the other day, that are dedicated to trying to find the vaccine for the virus. Now, why is that important? Well, obviously people want to find the virus fairly, uh, vaccine fairly quickly so we can try and return to normality. But it's also important that if one laboratory did it in the world and said, yep, this works, and nobody else was looking at it, um, then it's going, to take, it's going to take a long, long time for that vaccine to be validated. What we can do in the current climate where everyone is focusing on this one cure is we can have multiple laboratories doing similar experiments to make that validation process a lot quicker and get us to the end of having a vaccine, you know, maybe within a year rather than, you know, usually it takes a good couple of years to get it to any point like that. So the validation project, uh, process is important in any scientific theory. Um, not just vaccines, but that's a really nice example to think about. So, one of the other things we need to do is replicate our own experiment and have it repeated by others. These are quite distinct things. So, for yourself, you would want to repeat your study a couple of times or with multiple um, plants, for example, if you're look, we use the fertilizer experiment again. You wouldn't just use one plant one fertilizer, and then that's your data. Okay, you would repeat that multiple times with multiple plants to ensure that what you've found is actually happening. So you'd have multiple trials of the same experiment. Replication is slightly different. That's somebody else is producing, or sorry, repeating your experiment in their own laboratory. And they will come up with their own data set, which hopefully gives them similar results to what you had. And remember... The only way another scientist can replicate your data really accurately is if you have a fantastic method section. So remember the method section, I always describe it like a recipe. 
you need to make sure that somebody can take that recipe and conduct the exact same experiment as you or as close as, as, as they can to ensure that the results they have are compatible to your own, okay? So replication is really important and re repetition of your own experiments are really important. There's also another process. So this is why science is, it can be quite slow, but it needs to go through this process really to ensure that the science or the results that are getting produced and going out there are legitimate, okay? Because it can be very dangerous to publish information that isn't quite true. We saw this with the anti-vaxxer movement, which is still going around today, um, based on a paper that was redacted. So it was taken, it was published originally, and then it was taken off the shelves um, because it was found to be not good science. But the damage that is done from that has been crazy and still doing damage just now. So say I've written my paper, okay, I've done everything I need to do, I've done my statistical analysis, I've got my graphs, I've written my paper, here's my theory, what happens next? Well, it doesn't just go into the public eye, it goes to a bunch of reviewers. What you'll do is you'll submit your paper to a journal. So when I was doing my PhD, I published a lot in journals related to evolution or fish. And so say there was a the journal of fish biology, I would send my paper to them. The editor, the editor would have a quick look and then send it out to professors and doctors in my field who would then anonymously review my paper. And it can be quite a long process. It can be quite brutal as well. They ask, why did you do this? Why didn't you do that? I don't know about this analysis. Can you explain this a little bit further? So it can take 12 months, even 18 months to get through that process. So it can be quite a long slog. By the end of it, you've got an article that meets editorial and peer standards. So we call this the peer review process. We talk about peers. Your peers are your counterparts. So people that are related to you, for example, in the school, your peers would be other year livings. My peers would be the teachers. Um, when we talk about peer review, we're talking about other scientists in your field that know what they're talking about. Um, so they can really cast their expert eye over your information and make sure what you've done is appropriate. And this is just another way of, a nicer way of kind of illustrating the peer review. So you submit your manuscript, the journal checks it initially, it gets submitted to reviewers, they will be a bit of back and forth, they'll give you revisions, you need to make those revisions, there'll be a final check, and then the article will be published eventually. And that can take a long time, it can take a long time. But it's necessary to ensure that the data that's getting put out there to the public has been reviewed expertly. And this is one of the problems, <coughs> excuse me, one of the problems we have uh, with fake news and everything else. There's not, <laughs> none of these checks takes place. You can just write something based on an opinion you have. It goes out there and a lot of people believe it is fact. One of the things I want to do for you guys over the course of this year is ensure that you guys really look at things objectively in question has this information really been scrutinized? Has it been poured over by experts? Uh, what does the scientific community say about this information? Or does it look like it's the opinion of somebody who might have an agenda or isn't really well informed, but they can, they're maybe writing it quite convincingly, but there's absolutely zero evidence to back up their claims. And I think that's the problem we're in at the moment. A lot of people are not scientifically literate. Um, they believe that science is opinions it's not we just present the data um, and the data never lies it's something that uh, if you're a good scientist it never lies you just present what you found um, so it's something that I think our society is lacking from quite a lot at the moment unfortunately so what leads to the development of a law well it's slightly different from the development of a theory a scientific law describes the phenomenon this description is usually mathematical and describes a cause and effect relationship, that is, relationships between set variables. As one is changed, so the others are affected in a scientific way, sorry, a specific way. Scientific theories are quite often built on more than one scientific law. So, until we go over some scientific laws, which we're going to look at um, in next, I think, week, lesson, lesson seven, we're going to look at the scientific law. Um, this may not make a lot of sense, but it will do, okay? The, the key part here is the description is usually mathematical and describes a cause and effect relationship that is, 
the relationships between set variables. As one is changed, so the others are affected in a specific way. That's probably the key part of that sentence there. As one change, so the others are affected in a specific way. There's a relationship between the variables. If you change one variable, it will change another variable. And if you know that there's a relationship, what that means is, if you know part of the mathematical equation, you can calculate the other values usually in that mathematical equation. Okay, so slightly simpler version, I guess. You make a mathematical equation, you collect data, and you check to find if that result repeats itself over and over. And that's the process of a scientific law. So developing a law in st uh, science, laws in science are statements based on empirical collection of data. Empirical data collection is when we do experiments. They are usually expressed with a mathematical equation. Scientific laws do not try to explain an event or natural phenomenon. They, they describe what is happening at that moment of time when the phenomenon is being observed. They can also be used to predict f future events under similar or different circumstances. And the experiments to accept the law are repeated many times and the results have to show similar patterns for the law to be valid. Okay, this will become much clearer as we go through some examples. <clears throat> One such example which you may have heard of, or you should have heard of Isaac Newton, is his laws of motion. So he stated that there's three laws of motion that I'll explain. The first law is, well, using the apple. An apple at rest tends to stay at rest. So if something is on a tree or sitting on a table and no force is exerted on it, so I don't push it, I don't touch it, it doesn't move. Okay, that makes sense. The second law that we're going to talk about in more detail later on is force and weight give acceleration. Force, weight and acceleration are all interlinked. So the amount of force I apply to something is going to be is going to affect the acceleration and the acceleration is going to be based on the mass as well okay so we talked about it in the last lesson but f equals ma force equals mass times acceleration a simple example is if i use all my strength to push over a deck chair for example a garden chair in my back garden i run at it really fast and push it with all my might We'd hope, um, I've got a little bit of strength in me, that the chair would fall over. Okay? If I applied that same force to, say, my car, which has a much larger mass, then the acceleration of that car is not going to be the same because the mass is heavier. So there's a direct relationship with the amount of force I apply to something depending on how much it weighs, and then that's going to affect how quickly that thing moves. The third law is there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whenever you push something down, there's another equal force pushing back up against you. So we're not going to talk about that one too much either, but these are the three, Newton's three laws of motion. And this is them um, fleshed out a little bit. So law one, a body at rest will remain at rest and a body in motion will remain in motion unless it is acted upon by an external force. Number two, which we are which I concentrate on more, the force acting on an object is equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration of that object. We write that as F equals MA, where F equals force, M equals mass, and A equals acceleration. And law three, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You may have heard that before. So we're going to look at law two um, in a couple of lessons time. And hopefully that will help explain what a law really is in more detail. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Uh, Poppy Amish is here, as always, to give us a fact. He says 100 grams of banana have 358 milligrams of potassium. That's a lot of potassium. So that's why you see tennis players eating bananas, because potassium is good uh, for exercise and recovery and things like that. So, yeah, go eat a banana. Thank you, guys.